Welcome. This video interview is one of a series of seven. My name is Chris Heald. Throughout these videos, I will be interviewing John Beckford. During the COVID-19 pandemic in late 2020, John and I wondered why cybernetics and its learning about systems has not played a greater role in the global response to the pandemic. We concluded that cybernetics was not as accessible as it should be. So we decided to conduct these interviews. John is currently president of the Cybernetics Society and has written extensively on the subject. We are both consultant practitioners who use the ideas in our work. We have known one another and collaborated for approximately 20 years. We have never made videos before. Each one uh, lasts about an hour. The series is in a logical order, but they are also designed to be standalone, so you don't need to watch them in sequence if you choose not to. We have had great fun making these videos. And as Stafford Beer might suggest, we hope you will find them more or less useful. Please feel free to contact either of us. Um, at the end of the, the last episode, we conclude that cybernetics gives us a, a language and a framework really to describe and understand a system. Um, but it also highlights how and where we can intervene in um, such systems. And uh, today we're going to explore some of those interventions. So effectively, we're going to look at how we might use cybernetic thinking um, as a change tool um, in theory and through some practical examples. Um, however, before we start that, uh, uh, quite interestingly, when John and I were reviewing, uh, we ended up talking about um, a problem I had uh, earlier last year with a non-flushing toilet. And John said, that's a cybernetic system. Um, and actually, it was fascinating to hear him talk about it. So I thought I'd just give him a chance to talk a little bit about toilets and ballcocks as we get going. John. Chris, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for that one. Um, yes, the essence of, of, of thinking about systems as cybernetic is that they are self systems are self regulating. <clears throat> so the system is purposeful, it's, it's, it's acting to achieve a particular goal, and it's um, self-regulating in the sense that it manages itself in order to do that. And the perfect and simple example of a ball cock in a system um, is, is a perfect example of a cybernetic process. We have a tank, and we're seeking to fill the tank with water to a particular level in order to be able to flush a toilet. That's what we're after. Ball cock measures the volume of water in, in the system. So it, it, the water comes in and, it, and it, it, as it fills up the ball cock lifts. As the ball cock lifts, it acts as that the information lifts the ball cock, which operates a lever that closes the tap. So it stops water coming into the system. So it only fills up to a particular level. It won't, assuming it's working, it won't overfill. When we flush the toilet, the tank empties the, the cybernetic valve drops down again, the, the, the ball cock drops again, opens the tap, lets the water in, and the system comes back up to the stable point where we want it, which is a full system ready to flush the toilet. So we don't have to intervene in this management, we don't have to turn the tap on and off, we don't have to think or act, we just allow the system to regulate itself. So provided all the parts are in working order, it will maintain itself in a, in, a, in, a, in a state of homeostasis. It will sit there as a stable system, re-regulating its water level every time we operate it. But um, mine wasn't working. And if you recall, uh, it, it had been completely fine until we had a, a break in service because of uh, a mains um, <clears throat> just along the road. And it was uh, when the water came back on, and my analysis was that there was some kind of surge um, that caused the uh, some damage to that system. So then it stopped to function properly and was leaking. So, I mean, I guess that fits in with uh, 
sort of environmental part of cybernetics, does it? Is that? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's two levels. So your 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 causation of failure might have been the surge of, of, of water flushing back through the system when the when the system came back on, which could have caused a blockage in the pipework. It could have been of sufficient pressure to bend a bit of plastic, which is quite common. The bit of plastic itself may have bent. So what we're what we're looking at is, is saying we have a system, we understand how it should work. So what we're able to do is then diagnose what's wrong with it when it fails. So we can look at it and we can say, okay, it didn't let water in, or in your case, it let too much water in. Um, why did that happen? And we can look at the components of the system and go back to saying the stable state we want to achieve is a, is a stable level of water in the in the system. This thing, this input is not working. So the lever didn't close the tap or the lever closed the tap too soon. The bull cock didn't float. I mean, they, <laughs> again, if we get into the mechanics of the thing, the plastic wears over time. So once the bull cock reaches a particular point, maybe it doesn't then lift up because it's, it's caught somewhere in the levering system. So we can look at the various inputs to the control system and say, does the ball cock still float? Does the lever still operate? When it operates, does the, does the end of the lever still close the valve? So we can actually go back through a diagnostic process of saying, what is wrong with the system and fix it? And it may be that we can say there's nothing wrong with our system, but the external system, the, the, the context in which it's now operating, cold water is coming, clean water is coming through at too high a pressure, so the, the valve hasn't got enough in it. So we have to go back to another part of the system and regulate the pressure somewhere else. Yeah, so that was quite, it's quite inter interesting. So effectively what I'm hearing you say is that when I had to intervene, which I did, I'm trying to get the system back into uh, uh, performing its purpose, um, which it had stopped doing because of the, uh, the, the surge. And I think something had broken. Um, but, but so, you bring back can, the I, can I come back in? Because it brings us to a really interesting and really useful distinction in cybernetic thinking. The early cybernetics, the, the very simple you know, self-regulating system that I've described would be the sort of mechanistic cybernetic models that were being talked about in the 1930s and 40s that were applied to some quite complex problems such as you know, um, regulating the depth of water in a harbour and regulating the the, the, the the ballistics of a machine gun trying to attack an aircraft and all sorts of other interesting things like that. But they were very machine you know, mechanistic systems. They were called first order cybernetic mechanisms. Second order cybernetics is what we're now talking about and what we've done is we've shifted from observing the system to being part of the system so that our observer is also a part of the system that they're observing, which is a bit of a complicated story. So your, your self-regulating toilet flushing device uh, is fine and you can leave it alone as long as it's working. When you then go and want to intervene in it because it's not doing what you intended it to do, you have become part of the system of, of regulation. So your intervention, your managerial input, if you like, to that system shifts it from first order cybernetics to a second order cybernetics where the observer of the system is also intervening in its management. So I became part of the system. That's very you interesting. Part of the system, and, and actually in this occasion, I was able to fix it, although I'm not an expert in toilets. Um, and it took a number of iterations in the sense that I didn't really diagnose the issue fully the first time so I replaced the broken piece of plastic but then uh, it, there was something happening about the pressure as well so I had to make some adjustments so that's very interesting to to, to look at that so but I became part of it and I, I, I guess if you've got nothing further to say about my toilet we could kind of move on to um, uh, uh, look at organisational um, uh, interventions and how you might you know, think from a cybernetic perspective when you're looking at a kind of change problem in an organisation, because I guess that's just a slightly more complex and bigger challenge than the, 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 the toilet system functioning to its purpose. Um, to a level, 
to, to cyberneticians at one point was everything is a toilet in the sense that everything is a self <laughs> everything is a self regulating system, um, and we can uh, depending on, on the level of granularity with which we approach it, we can we can observe those um, self regulating processes existing inside organisations. <clears throat> so we might have a sales process which is concerned with you know, hitting a particular sales target in in, in, a, in a in an environment selling a particular product with a particular methodology with a particular set of skills and behaviors brought to it by, by the sales staff <clears throat> so at one level the process itself is is relatively simple you know, identify customer identify product engage in conversation make sale is a sort of you know, very simple form of, of process and we can map and model that sort of um, process activity quite quite easily. We can create then a hierarchical structure that's over it that, that, that attempts to regulate and manage that process of sales. But it gets interesting when we look at, at that process. Say, well, there's, there's the processy bit, but there's also the skills of the staff that are engaged in that sales process and their behaviours and their approach to the customers and the, the values that they bring to that, to that conversation. So we go from something which, you know, in the toilet flushing thing is, is very, very simple to something where the behavior of the people, both as the sales staff and as the potential customers, massively informs the way in which the transaction is carried out and whether or, whether or not the objective of sale is, is achieved is as much or if not more about the behavior of the people than it is about the actual process that, that underlies the behavior of the people. So we want them to follow a process so that we know we're, we're doing it in a reliable manner. We'll create it, and particularly from, a, from a, 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 an organizational point of view, knowing that everybody is selling something the same way, and particularly if you're in financial services, it's regulated. So it has to be done in a particular way and certain forms have to be filled in a particular way. Um, those things become, become key. If we then want to go and change the way that it's done, <clears throat> The process itself may or may not be regulated, so we have to look at uh, what is the set of process activities, what are the inputs of those processes, what are the outputs that we get. But we also have to look at the behaviours of the people and the skills, knowledge, insights that they bring, that they apply to that process in order to conduct it. So managing change then becomes a much more challenging problem because we not only have to diagnose what is wrong with the process we also have to understand how to intervene in order to be able to bring about the change that we want and that might be a change in the process it might be a change in the skills of the people that are conducting the process it might be a change in the information that they're using it might be a change in the values that they apply <coughs> excuse me to the process in order to make it to make it work and it might be a change to the skills that they have there's a how, there's a why, there's a what. <clears throat> and as a manager or as a change agent, we need to look at our whole complex set of activities and say, of all these things that are going on that are designed to achieve that outcome, which one or more of them do I need to intervene in in order to bring about the change that, that I desire? But that gets us back to now a hierarchy of systems starting to emerge because as a change manager, somebody is seeking to bring about change in the system. Again, I'm observing the system, I'm part of the system, now I'm managing the system or attempting to because I'm intervening in it. Now, I might be intervening in it because it's my system and I'm regulating it and I've become the ball cock, but it might be that I'm a higher order part of the system, I'm a, an outside body, I'm a consultant that's been brought in, I might be a, a senior manager in the organization um, bringing a different saying we, we, we require different outputs so we've got a hierarchy of systems now going on but there's a self-regulating activity down here and, a, and maybe two or three layers of managerial activity that sit on top of it which are also seeking to intervene in the management of the system okay so that got quite complex quite quickly um, so but but we started with a relatively simple sales system in this example yeah and what i got was we can map the process of how sales happen and we can do that at an individual transaction level or we can do it at a kind of organizational 
level. So there's a couple of layers in there, but we can do it in that way. That's a, the process. Then you add the human piece in, and in a way you can also map the you know skills and behaviours you want from people to make that process work. And they might be doing them, you know, very effectively, or they might be suboptimizing. And then there's the question of if they are suboptimizing and you're not in a system's no longer achieving its purpose and you know op operating to its full potential you're then looking at you know should we intervene and if we intervene what do we need to do is it process change is it training and skills development is it change of personnel is it more people and at what level do we need to do that that's what i'm hearing you describe in in overview is that is that right yes it is right and that's and that's the so, so the, the outcome is emerges from the synthesis of the process the people and their behaviors and values and skills and the information that they that they work with so when we want to change the outcome we have to look at which bit of these this complex set of things and their interactions which is the other bit we haven't talked about um where do we intervene in that and how do we intervene in it in order to get the outcome that, that we're after and we you know, and we can start that by, by comparing the outcome we got with the outcome we wanted and we would sensibly engage the people that operate the process in that conversation so and, and we we watch football managers from time to time having those conversations with their with their players after after a game we we lost why did we lose what did we do wrong what could we do differently next time so there's a whole rich um, body of knowledge about how you have that conversation with people how you engage people in those processes whether it's from the you know the change literature or the quality literature or the process management literature doesn't really matter um, but what we're what we're doing is is, is we're we're trying to understand how when to intervene in the process in order to close the gap between what we got and, and what we actually wanted to get so that's a, so that's really interesting so the, the cybernetic thinker there is asking those kind of questions and this is my prejudice in a way but but if you're a you know a sales expert or consultant you might come in with your you know you know particular um, elements of a sales process will be more effective than others so you look at it from a the kind of you can improve the process but you might not see the whole picture is that what you know that that's the difference we might get here if we think about this as cyberneticians yes yeah, so cybernetics is saying look at the whole system yeah. and look at all of the loops that cause the outcome to be what it is and work out which of those needs to be adapted in order to give you the outcome that you actually want um, and yes i mean a, a, a functional managers functional experts inevitably will come at a problem if, if everything i think we said this in episode one if everything if the only tool you've got is a hammer every every problem is a nail um and one of the challenges for all of us coming coming at change in organizations is that our thinking is informed by a recent experience our thinking is informed by the knowledge set we've acquired over umpteen years by the things that we've experienced and done so we tend to come at this problem with the same mindset that we came at the previous problem because it worked there well surely it will work here um, what the cybernetics gets us to do is to lay out the diagnosis i'd like to say more objectively differently subjectively we, we it, it's inevitably sort of some of it's quite subjective um, that we bring a different subjectivity to it when we consider it from a cybernetic perspective or from a whole system perspective when we try to capture not only what is happening inside the organization but also what's happening you know, what's the context of things that are happening outside the organization that are informing you know, the, the ways that, that, that people choose to work so if you are a um what's a good example I mean, you're a car salesman at the moment now, under COVID conditions with car dealerships effectively closed to passing visitors so you know, the whole sales process has changed and, it, and it's no good um, wandering into a car dealership and teaching the salesman how to be better at dealing with customers face to face when they're not allowed to deal with customers face to face so their, their sales problem at the moment needs a different diagnosis 
if you're a supermarket operator and people are shifting to online purchasing, you need a different sales model. So you can't fix the problem by doing more of the same or doing one, one thing different. You actually have to think about the whole context of not only what is my process, but also how is the context into which that process is being applied changing and deal with both of those aspects. So, um, and there's, there's, there's definitely something in there about, you know, transferable knowledge, isn't there, that we will, you bring into the, the, the kind of process, you know, you, you know, I'm thinking about my toilet again, but I definitely was transferring knowledge I'd got from <clears throat> problems around the household to this challenge. Um, and, um, and I, I like your caution about um, it being objective, but what I'm what I'm saying here is that actually the ambition is to be as objective as possible when you're laying out what the the system looks like and you're diagnosing it. And there will be some lenses that mean it is it has that subjectivity, but you're trying to be as objective as you possibly can when you're doing that. I think is what you're you're saying. Well, certainly, you're, you're, what you're trying to do is ground your diagnosis in let's call them facts, in, in, in measurements, repeatable, reliable measurements of what's going on that allow you to say, look, you know, I see it like this and I see it like this because I see this evidence of, of these characteristics and being able to refer to the evidence grounds the analysis, grounds the sort of the diagnosis in something which you can say, yes, look, every time we do, every, every time we flush the toilet, it fills with water again, it's working. Is an objective measure of the level of water in the in the system. We don't actually have to know what the level of water is because it doesn't matter. What we have to know is the ball cock will shut off the valve when it gets to the appropriate point. So our diagnosis is kind of going: the toilet doesn't flush, the system's empty. Why isn't the valve working? Um, and, and there's not there's not so much subjectivity when you come to human systems. Um, yeah. It, it, it's not just about the process. It's not just about the language we talked about. You know, that we talked about you know, semantics last time. It's also about you know, my mood and your mood, and whether I'm in a mood to be satisfied by adequate, or whether I want something more. And the nuance of the conversation becomes very rich. So, so we might. Um, it always made me laugh. Something years ago, when when banks started to get excited about customer service. And one of the big banks um, started um, advertising that they answered the telephone within four rings. Um, and it was true, they did. The trouble was they never said anything useful when they picked the phone up. <laughs> so yes, you could get through in the sense that you could start a conversation with the, with the service provider. What you couldn't do was get any change brought about in the condition that you were addressing because the person that picked up the phone was a phone picker up, but they weren't a problem solver. We see the same in um, call centers, and call centers are sort of notorious for this. Um, and then, you know, the sort of the, the, the stupidity of the way we manage organizations sometimes. So, call centers, uh, most organizations use forms of performance measurement and management in order to do the things that they believe are important. And a common one is the number of you know, the number of rings of the telephone or how quickly people answer the phone but they also then get measured on how productive they are and in call centers commonly and this is this is changing in fairness but a common measure of performance in a call center is you know, how many calls are, are, are queuing up but how quickly do you get the customer off the phone and there's an escalation that happens. So you ring up a call center and the first time you get to oh, hello, Chris, how are you? And you have a good chat and we talk about the problem and they get you off the phone in one minute, having promised to solve your problem. But actually, they haven't. So the next time you ring up, it takes two minutes. And the time after that, it takes eight minutes. And the time after that, it takes 64 minutes. So the whole problem escalates because the performance measurement characteristic is focused on something that might serve the short-term interest of the organization but doesn't actually meet the need of the customer. So you may say I'm getting ahead of myself here but the question that prompts in my head is when you're working with clients how often is your intervention effectively about a kind of improvement or establishing a continuous improvement of the existing system and how often 
do you think well the system's just in, inappropriate we need to change this more radically and more fundamentally um and when i ask that question i've got i've got in the back of my mind i've got a conversation we had many years ago around a mutual client that probably should remain nameless where their finance team had a thousand plus accountants in it and you know i remember we had a conversation about what well, you know how do we improve the processes and systems within that team and you said well why have we got a thousand in the first place maybe we need to be much more radical about this because maybe we only need 50 or 100 if we do this differently so there's there, there are <clears throat> There are two levels of conversation that, that, that then go on with the client and, and, and with, with the work that you're doing. Um, the conversation one is really saying, what is it you're trying to achieve? How is it you're going about trying to achieve it? So you're looking at, does this process that you've got actually answer the question that you, that you set yourself in the first place? Can this process generate the outcome that you want? And if it can, then you have a, um, you, know, you can have a look at how does that process operate? How might I improve it? So you can look at things from a, from a, if you like, a continuous improvement point of view. Then how do I make this process better? And the objective of that is relatively short term and it's about improvements in, let's call it, you know, productivity or efficiency. When you start to examine how the process is operating, you might start to consider, well, in the light of, for example, uh, emerging technologies, is this the best way to do it? Have we got, the process might be fit for purpose, but might there be a different or better way of doing it, taking advantage of, of things that have happened outside the organization in, in subsequent periods. So far from then saying, let's do things better, we might say, let's do better things. So we might say, um, and, and taking that particular example, the accounting is, 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 is stuck in, a, um, let's call it a madness of tradition about the way that it does things, that it captures data in a particular way, it stores it and structures it and, and, and sums it in particular ways that meet a whole bunch of, of, of external regulatory requirements. And that's fine, that has to be done. But the technology that enables it or enabled it 50, 60 years ago was um, uh, traditional forms of bookkeeping and what we've done in, in the 50 years since is we've made electronic forms of bookkeeping that follow the same process that follow the same structures that follow the same rules um, what we haven't done is rethought how that process could work we've taken the old process the manual process the analog process and embedded it in a digital system instead of saying hmm if we were inventing this today to achieve that outcome, what could the process look like given the capability of the technology? So actually what we could do, and, and it's, it's a really good example, <clears throat> and, and some of the more modern systems do it, in generating an order, we could also generate, <clears throat> excuse me, an invoice and we can generate a dispatch note, we can generate all sorts of other things as a consequence of one set of activities. So we can, in the process of completing the sale, we also generate the invoice. In generating the invoice, we also generate the bookkeeping entry so that we have, <coughs> excuse me, no bookkeeping to do because the bookkeeping happens as a consequence. When we look at um, a really large scale you know, finance operation in, in, in a big business. Um, we find that there is the opportunity to fundamentally rethink what is being done. Because there's a number of things going on. Number one, unless we change the process, the outcome next year will be more or less the same as the outcome this year, depending on the number of widgets that we put into the front of a manufacturing machine. So when we come to budget for a big organization, we can do budgets in one of two ways. We can have thousands of budget meetings with thousands of people in thousands of locations for hours upon hours. Or we can say, hmm, what, was, what did we actually do last year? And how many, you know, how many units of whatever did we did we produce? How many units of whatever are we intending to produce next year? And given that we have the same process, the number of units that we're planning to produce will drive the budget that we need to have. 
So all those accountants are wasting their time because actually the budget will be what the process determines the budget will be because that's what causes the cost and income of the business. So if we understand the process generates data and that data translates into budget, we look at the process as the driver of bookkeeping rather than the bookkeepers as the drivers of bookkeeping. When we do that, what we want our accountants to do is validate whether the numbers that are coming out of the system are correct. And we, what we want our thinkers to do is say, is there a better process for producing these units, which has lower cost, higher value, greater throughput, lower labor, whatever. We need to intervene in the process, not intervene in the bookkeeping in order to drive the improvement. So, so back to my question of a while ago then, so do you find that most of your interventions are about, you know, improving that process or do you find that they are broader? And I, I kind of guess when you're improving the process and I've called it continuous improvement, part of the role of the kind of cybernetics, you know, uh, change consultant, whatever you want to call the person, is to embed a continuous improvement philosophy within that organization so they don't rely on an intervention each time but they're able to modify the system and the process as for, for themselves in future yeah so you want to embed in the organization always the ability to look after itself in the future so you're, you're trying to, to work with the client to help their organization become an adaptive system and okay. in so doing, you embed the cybernetics in the information system in the behaviors in the process so you know, the, the processes of reflection that we've, that we've talked about. Um, there's a big question which is about the appetite of the organization, its ability, if you like, to accommodate the changes that might be possible. So you're having a conversation with, with somebody that says, you know, well, you, could, you, you, know, you can make this slightly better. You can improve it and you can improve it, improve it. But there's a limit to the extent to which you can refine an existing process limited by technology, limited by, by skills, people, machines, whatever. So there's so much you can do and, and, and no further. But when you're having that higher order conversation with the, with the client, it then becomes a conversation about, you know, if this is your current purpose and these are your current standards, is that actually your aspiration? So you get into a conversation about aspiration and ambition. So what is it you'd like to be able to do? And how might we then intervene in the process and in the, in the shape of the organization in order to deliver that bigger ambition? So you've actually got a, a couple of things going on. The, the pure operating level, yes, you can make it slightly better. But then you get into the conversation about aspiration and ambition. And you're actually saying, that's the output you're currently working towards. That's the outcome you're currently seeking to achieve. Is that actually the outcome that, that really matters? Is that actually the outcome that the organization really wants? And if it is, maybe there's a better way of doing it, but maybe it isn't. And then you're into a very different conversation about purpose and values and so on. So you get into a conversation about what does the reorganization really exist to do? And that forces you into a, into a much more reflective conversation where you're saying, well, you know, if I was designing a university today, it probably wouldn't look much like this. So let's think about how do we design a, a university for a modern context would be a, a really interesting conversation. Yeah, okay. So if we think about the, um, the kind of incremental bit within the existing system, improving the process, uh, I think you're, you're, you dropped in the, the, the idea of appetite. So I can easily imagine that senior people would see what you might regard as relatively minor improvements, if they can get an extra five or 10% every year out of their process and they're bonused on that, the appetite for doing that is in many ways, the bonus is quite important there. The appetite for doing that is probably more attractive than chucking the whole thing up in the air on the hope that we can, you know, completely redesign it from scratch, which is probably a scary place for many, uh, um, executives in organizations um i described it i think once as trapped in an insanity of tradition um yes. that we can we can optimize but 
doing the wrong thing better doesn't actually deliver an improvement that we can get excited about. So we actually have to really understand what's the right what's what's the right outcome. So improving the fuel efficiency of, of cars, for example, yeah, of course that's a good thing to do, and of course it will take a long time to change from um, hydrocarbon-based uh, you know, uh, fuels to some other form of, of natural energy-based um, fuel. And there's a massive transition to go through in, in order to achieve that. But at some point, somebody has to be brave and say, well, actually, we, we need to think about this a slightly different way. Um, on a much more, you know, a, a much smaller scale, uh, yes, if I'm the factory manager and I'm responsible for making widgets or biscuits or cakes or whatever, um, I can't suddenly turn around to my bosses in a big corporation and say, look, guys, um, I'm fed up with making cakes. I'm going to make biscuits from now on because I think it's... You know, I'm constrained from being able to do that. So, so, so the conversation with a cybernetician has to be conditioned by the level inside the organization at which they're working. So if I'm talking to a chief executive, I can talk about much more um, ambition and um, in, in terms of the scale of change than I can if I'm talking to a factory manager or, or, or a production manager on a, on a production line, because their autonomy is different. So we have to then start thinking about our organizations, not just in terms of, of the hierarchy which which is inevitable but actually the freedoms that go with the roles and responsibilities that people have within an organization so it's no good me talking about you know, overthrowing the the current paradigm if what i'm doing is, is is talking to people who have no um freedom to make that change so there's a conditioning that goes on in, in understanding that and yes the ambition and the appetite and i'm doing some work at the moment where the appetite is to deliver a fundamental transformation in the way an organization thinks about the way it sets up and manages its assets. And that is something which has been sanctioned at the highest level within the organization. It has significant resource behind it. So you can have a much more ambitious conversation um, than you otherwise could where somebody says, well, actually, we just need to get through till Friday. So, well, that requires a high degree of courage and bravery to do that. Um, I think that's really interesting. The, the whole notion of, of, of courage is interesting, isn't it? Um, is it more courageous to make the change or to not make the change, I think is an interesting sort of philosophical point. If you can see that it's going wrong, if you can see it's not delivering the outcome that in your heart, in your mind you believe is appropriate, then I think you have an obligation to challenge it. Because they, not everybody, not everybody comes at it with the same um, insights. If you have an insight that, that shows something um, different in terms of ambition, that it's right to share it. They don't have to listen. <laughs> Commonly, my experience over thirty years is sometimes they don't listen, um, and that's that's fine. That's that's their prerogative. But I do think, as a, as a you know, as somebody intervening in the organisation, you have an op you have an obligation to share the insight and to try and be persuasive about, about what they might do differently. And I come back to the, um, you know, to the bonuses. Behavioral economics says people do what they're rewarded for. So actually one of the things we have in, 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 in um, when we start to look at organization <clears throat> in their totality is we also have to look at the reward system, both financial and non-financial, intrinsic and extrinsic. And say, so, you know, if people are doing what they are rewarded for, then let's make sure we've created a reward system that encourages the things that we want to see. Because you know, if we set up something, that says, we need this massive change over here, but I'm going to punish you every time you change something because I'll take away your bonus. You're not going to get the change that you want. So um, I'm, I'm <clears throat> to just separate you from others that might work with cybernetics. Because what I hear is that you would very much have the aspiration to work with the whole system and challenge that. And I guess all that work with cybernetics would see it and hope to challenge it. But I guess also that lots of people could do really good work about process and system improvement without necessarily uh, having the relationship with the chief executive or the person that is overseeing the whole system it's not you don't have to have that relationship to be a, a practitioner with cybernetics do you no you don't um 
what shifts is the is the ability to um, genuinely change the organization so you can deliver improvement um, in a constrained context so so you know, my, my my early work you know, literally you know, on the production line in a cake factory trying to find ways of working with this production line to, to shift productivity and it was enormous fun it used exactly the same principles about understanding the the, the information flows and the feedback loops and, and so on but it was done at the level of, of 50 cake makers on a, on a production line um, it delivered well, the maximum we got to was 40 <clears> percent <throat> improvement and that that yeah, and applying these ideas about information yeah, that was massively beneficial for the factory um it was massively beneficial in terms of sustaining employment as well as increasing productivity and so on so so the profitability of the factory got better which meant the jobs were better secure, which is which is, is, is a very good outcome what it couldn't do is ask a political question about the suitability of making cakes and and, and whether that was a a healthy thing for a nation so there's not a legitimate question at that level. So you have to understand in intervening what the autonomy of the decision makers is and test for yourself whether you can do something which is authentic and valuable within the set of constraints that apply to them. And that's yeah, that's that can, and even a chief executive, that can be a, that can be an interesting an interesting and challenging conversation because of course chief executives don't have anywhere near as much freedom as either they or we like to think they have much yeah, yeah, yeah. no but I, but I, I but i what i take from your answer there is that if, if if you've got awareness of cybernetics then you should be able to provide the insights to the organization of what you see and you'll have awareness of the wider system but you can still choose to support an intervention that might be about improving a particular process within that wider system um, and do good things with that. And then it's a matter of finding the right people at the right time to have the conversations about the, 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 the more fundamental system change and the kind of purpose of the organization. Um, there's a couple of things that, you, that um, uh, I've heard you talk about in these conversations but also in the past that I wonder if we ought to think about when we think about that whole organization so I've heard you talk a lot about potential and rather than looking about incremental improvement how do we actually see what's possible and the potential of an organization so that's one thing and then the second thing I've seen you talk about and you referenced it before was about how when you're looking at a whole organization how you diagnose how that whole organization interacts in terms of its future present and making choices about the now and the, the future and I'm, I'm aware we've you know we might come back to those in subsequent conversations but but they feel relevant to whole organization interventions so maybe you could comment a bit um so the, a couple of teasers then for the next episode is what is what that feels like um, okay. no, that's that's completely fine, but uh. <laughs> oh, well, because they're both they're both very big topics. Um, okay. and so uh, trying to do justice to them in short time doesn't really work. So um, an organisation as it stands today, any organisation um, with its processes, its systems, its people, its behaviours, etc., um, should be able to provide a pretty objective statement about its its capacity, its ability to do things, whatever those things are, whether it's making widgets or providing banking services, or it doesn't really matter. It should be able to say, with these resources configured in this way, we can do this much of this thing. In order to understand its performance, it then should measure what it actually does against what it said it's capable of doing. And the measure of those two things set against each other is, is something we call efficiency or productivity. How much work did the, did the resources actually do relative to what they could have done. And that's fine. Those resources, though, those systems, those processes, those machines, those, those activities, those skills, those behaviors are configured in a particular way. And that constrains what can be done with them. So the exploration of potential says this is the current capability under current circumstances, under current configurations. However, if we 
changed something, if we overcame some of those constraints, if we had bigger machines, faster machines, different machines, if we adopted a different process, could we have more capacity? So that's the potential. It's looking at that and saying, hmm, if we did things differently, applied a different technology maybe, perhaps we could, we could get more value out of that same set of resources. But we then have a gap between our capability and our potential. So that's the latency of the organization. It's latent value embedded in what we've got that we're not yet able to realize. So we've now got two things we want to manage. We've got managing productivity, doing things better, the gap between actual and capable. And we've got um, latency, doing better things, the gap between ca current capability and potential. And when we bring all that together, we have a measure of the overall effectiveness of the organization, not just against what it does do, but against what it could do. So in the first, of those, in the first of those, you, you know, in, in my kind of simple terms, you might look at, you know, best day or best hour or best week of production and wonder why you can't replicate that every day, month or week of the year. And that shows you a kind of clear difference what's been happening in those periods that mean we're uh you know not as productive as we might be and in the second yeah, that, 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 that's right and, and some of that might be absolutely um measurable so you know, a machine may produce a maximum of x tons of, of whatever per week because that's just inherent in the design of the machine so we might have some things which are pretty much fixed in that regard and we might have some things which are as you say experiential our best ever day was this why yeah, and then in the second case, actually, you can see that technology, other technology or other thinking could improve what we're doing. So by, by, by making changes there, we can get much more out of the, the, the so we might have people that are much capable of doing more if they're given the, 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 the means to, to actually do that. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think you know, you've nailed it there with, for me, the, the biggest frustration in most of the organizations that I've worked with is their inability to exploit the capability of the people that they employ. So actually you find very, very capable people who are constrained by the processes in which they're, in which they're obliged to operate. So there's something there which is, which is really, really important. On the, on the, other, on the second question, um, Pete Dudley's trialogue, which I know you're familiar with and, and which will, will explode the minds of various listeners, um, says that any organization has to do three things simultaneously. It has to manage its present, it has to create its future, and it has to nurture its identity. So the first of those things is, is, is about, it's back to flushing the toilet, it's about maintaining the water level in the system. So managing the present is all about doing as well as you can the job that you've currently got. Creating the future is about understanding the possibility space for things you might do in the future, for other ways of being, other ways of acting, other products, other services, other clients, and understanding how what we currently do might meet the needs of people we don't currently serve, or how the needs of people we don't currently serve might get translated into products and services, for example, that we might create. So we have two things going. We're saying you know, we want to be better at what we're doing, we want to be doing different things. And so that inevitably sets up a tension between the two parts of, uh, of the conversation. And we resolve that conversation by reference to what, what we call the identity of the organization. This idea that um, the values, beliefs, aspirations, ambition of the people that create the organization effectively act as an arbiter between those two competing sets of, of demands. So do we do more of this? Do we improve that? is driven by the values of the people that actually make that decision. So we have a conversation in at least three parts, which is, you know, which is about the current, about tomorrow, and about the why, about how we choose between those, those options. And those are very values-driven um, decisions. Um, that's part of a model called the viable system model, which, which I've spent a lot of time working on, and undoubtedly we will come back to. It's the critical, model in organizational cybernetics if we if we choose to distinguish that from from other branches of the of the thinking and that's probably mainly what we're talking about now 
and that's probably is enough for today because as you say those concepts of potential and trialogue and the bsm uh, probably will well they, they do warrant an, an episode that addresses them more fully and i think that's probably where we will 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 go next but for today thank you there's lots of uh, really interesting examples that we've covered today about um you know how we can use our cybernetic thinking to um uh, to both diagnose and then de decide whether and how to intervene in a in a in a, uh, a a system and some of the things that might uh, restrict that about appetite and the kind of political uh, will of the the people that are, uh, are running and at the top of those systems so thank you for that and um, if you've got any final words that's fine but otherwise um, until next time thank you very much thanks chris